Thank you very much. I'm so glad to see a lot of people here, and especially my students. That's always great. Um, this topic kind of came about um, by accident. I was attending um, an art exhibit on a retrospective of Bell's work in 2006 with some colleagues, and um, got to looking at her paintings and thought to myself, first of all, I've lived in San Diego for so many years and I've never heard of this person. And secondly, I started to think to myself, wow, there's got to be more to it than just a few murals and paintings. And as I have um, researched it further and further, I have come up with some interesting information about her um, that I hope to share with you here today. Um, Bell actually started out as um, an art student in the 1920s in Chicago. Um, and so her, her trek from Chicago to San Diego takes quite a few years. But as a, as a young art student, and I'm just going to put this slide up here so that you have plenty of time to look at it. We'll be talking about it more in depth in just a second. Um, but the, her work is very uh, reminiscent for those of you that study art history. Um, her early work here is very reminiscent of Cezanne. Uh, a little bit of Matisse ruled in there, and um, a, a period that we like to call in art history in the early part of the 20th century um, of German Expressionism. Um, so she's dealing a little bit here with Cubism as well as um, adding some vibrant color to her work. And this kind of art had not really been um, something explored too often uh, by students of her own age. And so Bell's early life and early schooling um, are interesting to look at because I think, as for most of us, as psychologists in the room would probably agree here, um, our early lives as children and what we grow up with has a lot to do with shaping the person we become later in life and, and having us um, develop uh, likes and dislikes, especially when it comes to um, artwork and what you would like to see hanging in your own house versus um, what you might want to, uh, what you might be asked or want to produce for others. So Belle's early life here in the 1920s um, is interesting to look at. She is actually born in 1902 and uh, for some strange reason, I'm not really sure, but I guess women historically lie about their age. Um, she's on record always as being born in 1905, but after um, some pretty exhaustive searches by um, scholars other than myself, the actual determination of her date has been placed in 1902. So she was born in Chicago, and in that period, um, her family faced a lot of upheaval, and she had a very turbulent early few years of life. Um, her father and mother actually separated in 1904 after the birth of her second, uh, her mother's second child. I think that this actually had a profound effect on her later development, both as an artist and also as an individual. Um, but when her father left in 1904, Bell actually ends up relocating to North Dakota, of all places, and lives on a farm with her grandparents. So that right away must have been kind of culture shock, going from downtown Chicago and living in probably an immigrant tenement area and then being catapulted to North Dakota and having all of a sudden farmland and animals around you. So she did a lot of early sketches and drawings and things of that nature as a, um, a young teenager um, that usually revolved around animal life and plants and things that were around her. So when she grows up and she becomes a young woman, she eventually migrates back to Chicago because um, in 1920 her parents reunite. Um, and it's kind of funny because we, we're not really um, too clear on who initiated the separation or divorce, but I think just from looking at her own personal papers, it was the father that initiated it. Uh, and the reason I have drawn this conclusion is that the birth certificate um, for her sister in 1904, uh, and the line where it states father's name, the mother had actually apparently told the doctor in the hospital that she wanted it put down as damn deserter because it was that bad. So she wasn't even going to give him credit 
for the actual <laughs> production of the child. So um, <laughs> I think that's kind of, so probably a little bit of bitterness there, I'm sure. So in any case, but what's very interesting about all of this is that um, uh, Bell's parents are uh, Romanian immigrants. They're also Jewish. And when she starts out as an art student in, in Minneapolis first and then later on in Chicago, she actually goes by the name of Goldschlager. Um, and Goldschlager in the 1920s and early 1930s definitely was going to stereotype someone as Jewish. Um, and we have to think about it from historical perspectives here about just how much anti-Semitism was already on the rise in Europe in that period. And I'm sure as artists always struggle historically, I don't think it would help you necessarily as an artist to be not only female, but also to have a Jewish last name. So she, somewhere along the line there, as, as a young student, she starts toying with the idea of changing her name. She doesn't actually change it to Baranchano until we get to 1932. That's when she formally does it. Um, but I think there, once again, probably a little anger towards the father. Um, and, and if you can strip yourself of his name and also advance yourself professionally, um, I don't think in her mind it was really seen as a bad thing. It was more of a positive thing to just get rid of dad's name and take on mom's. So in any case, Belle is going to study, first of all, at the Minneapolis School of Art. Um, and she begins there as a student in the um, early 1920s, and she will graduate in 1924. Um, while she's at the Minneapolis School of Art, she ends up meeting and working very closely uh, with another painter um, who actually becomes her mentor. Uh, and his name is Anthony Angarola. And for copyright reasons, I do not have pictures of Anthony Angarola. I have to go to the Smithsonian and get those. Um, because we really don't have a good shot of what he looked at like in the uh, years that he taught at both Minneapolis and the Art Institute of Chicago. So um, anyway, Anthony Angarola was a fan of, um, again, the post-impressionists, uh, the Cubist artists. Uh, he also was very much interested in the growing muralist movement in Mexico. And so the, all of these things, I think, are rolled in to her schooling and combined. And when she actually leaves and starts um, producing art on her own, you can see definitely Angarola's influence on her, but she also starts to develop her own unique style. Um, and Belle is one of these early um, California modern artists that are, is, she's very hard to place. And so um, if you asked Belle what kind of a painter she was, her answer was always a linear expressionist, which in art history circles really doesn't tell us much. It's kind of an odd, out there, uh, catch-all phrase for a, a number of different styles. And in interviews later in life, she often liked to say that she did not like to be stereotyped or placed in one specific category, that she felt that doing that was um, in many ways stifling an artist. And so she wanted to have her own artistic style evolve as she evolved and not necessarily pinpoint herself to only doing one type of art. She also was adamantly against, even from a very early age in art school, adamantly against producing art just for the sake of people buying it. She didn't want to be one of these people that was stuck um, producing art that they hated just simply so uh, their average middle class or upper class person in Chicago could buy something for their living room. Uh, she wanted to do something more meaningful than that. So in any case, uh, she begins in Minneapolis. After graduation in 1924, she moves on to study art um, as a postgraduate student with Angarola um, and eventually follows him to the Art Institute of Chicago. And she enrolls in there uh, around 1925, 1926. Uh, interestingly enough, though not surprising, um, a love affair does emerge. <laughs> and so Angarola becomes not only her, her mentor and her the guy that she will, for the rest of her life, credit as her number one influence artistically. Um, but there also seems to have been a love affair that developed out of that. And so in 1927, Belle's parents are well aware of what's going on. And so like all good parents, the first thing her father says is, we have to move you out of Chicago. You're going to go live with relatives in Los Angeles. 
end of story. And so she is not really given much of a choice. And um, for those of us that have looked at her personal papers, it's kind of the big what if question because um, Bell later on in life had burned all of her correspondence with them with the exception of about two or three letters. So we really can't um, fully understand the, the extent of the relationship that they had with one another. But in any case, in 1927, she moves on to Los Angeles and does live with relatives and starts to paint uh, on her own, but has a frequent correspondence back and forth with Anne Gorilla regarding different paintings and um, aspects of things she asked him for opinions on whether she should change um, parts of her paintings or if he thought this was a good idea, etc. And so Angarola ends up um, on a number of these, he will write in his letters and draw little sketches back um, regarding her artwork and her style. However, we can't really ascertain what the romance was at that point in time. So it seems anyway, for all intents and purposes, that her leaving Chicago and going to Los Angeles was actually a good thing. So maybe her father did know what he was doing by forcing the break. Uh, the other problem her father had with Angarola, besides the student-teacher relationship, was that he was nine years her senior. Um, he was an Italian, and remember they're Romanian Jews. Um, Italian and worse yet, Catholic. Um, and so those two things made him definitely undesirable as far as her parents were concerned. Uh, the other issue that they had was Angarola had children. And so the last thing they wanted to do was see their only, their, their, not their only daughter, excuse me, but see their daughter marry this older Italian Catholic man with children and inherit all of this baggage. So uh, for an Orthodox Jewish family, this would have been tremendously difficult. So when she moves to Los Angeles, she ends up really developing a style of her own. And so this painting that I have up here on the border, the overhead, is um, it's just simply called Los Angeles Hills. And it's one of a series of paintings that she actually showed in a um, exhibition both in Los Angeles and then also back in Chicago. And she actually won uh, a number of, of awards and recognition for this work and, and um, another one that's very similar to it called Riverview section of Chicago. Um, and one interesting thing that I like to point out in all of Bell's work when I talk about it is that she uses vibrant colors but very sparingly. It's almost as if she's afraid of color in some ways. Uh, and as a, a fellow colleague in San Diego would remark later on, um, Edward Jackson would always st state that you could tell a bell painting because it always had a touch of gray in it. And so anytime you saw gray, you could kind of <coughs> say, okay, that's a bell painting. So um, this one actually was written up and discussed in um, the uh, Tribune in Chicago and the art critic that was discussing it actually stated that this was a very un-Californian type of painting. Um, and I think he, what he meant to say or what he was trying to express there is the fact that rather than making it completely sunny and, you know, with all of our foliage and local um, uh, trees and all of that stuff, he, she tends to pick uh, very subdued colors and the gray in the background looks more uh, like an overcast sky rather than this sunny image that we all have of California. Um, so in any case, she ends up producing this work in 1926 and exhibiting it um, back in Chicago as well as um, in Los Angeles. But these are two other paintings done uh, in 1926 that are, again, you can see that her style is starting to develop and become more and more pronounced. On the left, this one I love because um, if you go through her papers, she has a lot of uh, not only sketches and notes about painting her grandmother, but she also laments just how difficult a woman this person was to work with. Um, and she writes every letter to relatives during this period, she constantly says, oh, grandmother's, you know, it's so hard to paint her, she won't sit still, the light is horrible, she has to take a nap every day. I mean, it's, <laughs> all of these things are getting in the way of her producing a, a great painting. So. She may have been done with it a lot sooner than she had um, 
we you know, she probably anticipated being done with it rather quickly, but um, her grandmother made things difficult for her. So anyway, the grandmother, uh, or gross smoother, as this painting is called, was done in Chicago. Um, on the right there, I also like this one, and this is one of Bell's few vibrant paintings, but um, on the right, this is a portrait of her sister, Teresa. Um, and Teresa has um, all sorts of issues of her own. She enters a bad marriage and has all sorts of drama in her family. But this is kind of um, one of the, the happier moments in her life. And I think that by looking at this, one of the, the artists that I most, um, that I see as most recognizable in this painting would be Gustav Klimt. So some of you that study art history can probably relate to that as well. A little bit of rocked, but mostly clipped. Um, and in any case, so this, this one actually wins a lot of acclaim as well when she exhibits it back in Chicago. So she's starting to become, in the late 20s, a recognized artist in Chicago. Not a famous artist, um, necessarily, um, but definitely recognized and is winning awards and is starting to be able to sell some of her work. Uh, but it's mostly because it's 1929, it's mostly, or 26 through 29 in this period, that she's mostly going to have to rely on teaching and other odd jobs to pay the bills. And therein lies the problem, because I think that's one thing that is so um, uh, distressing about this whole period when you study artists, it's always the big, what if artists could sit and paint and do nothing else? How much great work could they have produced? <coughs> uh, I think Belle was well on her way to doing a lot more. Uh, in any case, so after 1926-27, uh, um, uh, she's out and uh, moved from Chicago to Los Angeles. Uh, she will bounce back and forth between the two uh, between Chicago and LA, two cities, um, exhibiting work and settling it for a few months here and there. Um, by 1929, she had decided um, once and for all to move back to Chicago. And what happens in 1929 is that she finally, her, her uh, fiance or her lover or whatever we want to call him, Anthony Angarola, ends up proposing marriage to her. And he had actually been on a Guggenheim fellowship to go to Europe and study art and paint. And he was one of the first recipients to get one of those. Um, and so in 1928, he leaves for Europe and after being there for a few months, he comes to the realization he can't live without her. Um, they decide to get married. And so she goes out to Chicago in 1929 to meet him after he had just come back from Europe. And again, just absolutely tragic. He'd been in a car accident while in France. And he was, you know, it was probably just one of these routine little fender bender things. And apparently he was given the all clear by the hospital that he could leave and go back to the United States. And he'd been held over there for two or three days, um, longer than he had anticipated. So by the time he gets back to Chicago, they uh, apparently had agreed to hold a civil service as far as a marriage service was concerned. They planned to go to the courthouse um, in the morning and just have it over with and then um, go out to dinner with some friends. And so the morning of their wedding, she calls him and calls him and it turns out he had died in his hotel room. Um, and I know it's just so tragic. Um, and he dies, we think, I mean, I, this is probably prior to routine autopsies and CSI and all of this stuff, but um, he dies, we think, because he probably had some sort of a blood clot brought on by the car accident and it was never really properly checked out. So anyway, this is absolutely, you can only imagine um, how devastating that would be. And so after 1929, the, she's had this tremendous loss. Things are not really picking up uh, money-wise in Chicago. The depression is just about to crash. The stock market is just about to crash. And she realizes that um, she might just have to suck it up and go back to Los Angeles and live with relatives uh, and try to make a go of it on the West Coast rather than stay back East where the art market was definitely stronger. 
So before I move on to her, her murals, I also wanted to quickly show you this one. And um, this is a portrait that she did also in, in the late 20s. This one dates to about 1926 as well. This portrait is called um, Virginia. And the reason that um, art historians are fond of pointing this one out, uh, for those that know her work, is that this is one of the earliest depictions um, of not only an everyday woman, but an everyday African-American woman. Um, and this is not exactly a common subject for um, a lot of painters in that period. So by painting this, it was her way of not only depicting a figure that she thought was, was worthy of attention, um, but also, again, breaking down sort of racial barriers. And she had, apparently, throughout her life, um, definitely an affinity to breaking barriers between not only uh, race, but also different ethnic groups. And that was because of her own background and being labeled from a very early age as a German Jewish, or, <coughs> or sorry, Romanian Jewish female artist. And so she didn't like labels. And so for her to, to paint a subject such as this, this is kind of, I think, another way of breaking down barriers and working towards um, uh, being daring as far as subject matter for the day. She's going to move out to um, California again in 1929. And when she first moves out here, she initially moves to Los Angeles and lives with her uncle again for um, a little while and then finally reunites with her family uh, around 1933 um, in San Diego. And the Baranchano plan, as they refer to themselves, um, when they came out to California, part of their rationale for moving was that they did have relatives in this neck of the woods, but also that they claimed it was easier, and it makes a lot of sense. It's easier to be poor in a warm climate versus a cold one. Um, so nobody wants to suffer in a Chicago winter when they can be here where it's at least warm and bearable. So the, her mother actually had been trained in Romania as a pediatrician. And as is often the case with immigrants, when they come to this country, and this I'm sure occurs still today, um, when you come over and you immigrate to a new country, oftentimes you have to retrain for the same job you had in your home country. And so rather than spend all the extra time um, and money to retrain as a doctor, she ends up going to chiropractor school and she becomes a chiropractor. But even in 1929, 1930, there's not a huge demand for chiropractic services. So the Baron Shadows are really like many other people in the early years of the Depression, very much down on their luck, having to sort of pull all of their family resources together and make the best of things. Uh, so luckily for Belle, one opportunity um, comes about pretty soon after 1933. Uh, in 1933, Franklin uh, Roosevelt and his administration are able to continue some of the policies that Herbert Hoover had put in place as part of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Uh, and what, re what the RFC does for um, relief agencies in uh, 19. 32 is it at least creates a skeleton of sorts where people that were down on their luck and absolutely could not find any sort of employment were at least able to go to their local um, or state relief agencies and have some sort of help with things like groceries and rent um, and definitely with looking for jobs. Um, one thing that I think is always important to point out about the Great Depression is that this is a time period where people really want to work. Um, I think sometimes um, students that are thinking about this 75 years after the fact might say to themselves, well, I don't understand what the big deal was. Um, I, I don't get it. But there, there are no jobs, really, in this period. Um, people that had ordinary good paying jobs were losing them left and right and forced to take jobs that would have been held by unskilled laborers um, prior to 1933. So what Roosevelt's policy under FERA, it's F-E-R-A, and it stands for the Federal Emergency Relief Agency, or Relief Act that, that becomes um, an administration and an agency. Um, FERA ends up giving uh, the states allocations of money so that they can continue their relief roles. 
Um, in the early part of the 1900s, and those of you that are historians already know this, but there were not that many um, opportunities to, to get help. If you lost your job, you really had to rely on local charities or families for assistance. There isn't really an overall federal government system of relief. So um, for Bell and her family, they end up making the best of things, and it turns out um, the starving artist is the one that ends up supporting the family throughout the Depression. So it's kind of straight. Do you think a chiropractor would have a better shot at you know producing income? But this is not really the case. So starting under the Farah, Roosevelt gets to work right away, and he creates a number of agencies. And I love FDR because simply because he has these alphabet agencies. Um, everything is an acronym for something. And Roosevelt had a a, a as part of his Farah and. Um, idea, he had carved out money for the Civil Works Administration. And just to confuse you, part of the Civil Works Administration included a public works of art project. And so CWA, as it was called, was mainly <coughs> for construction workers. All of these jobs were supposed to stimulate the economy by having people build bridges, fixing highways, filling in potholes, uh, clearing brush from the sides of roads, uh, things of that nature. They were back to work projects, but they were always geared towards um, not only men, but also men that could do hard physical labor. So if you're a female and you're not used to manual labor, uh, not only would you not be very well suited for this type of work, chances are you're not even gonna be offered the job. So um, as one historian put it recently, uh, the uh, single female uh, young woman or head of household was the first orphan in the Great Depression store. So ultimately, uh, it was the pecking order was such that um, men needed work first and then women were forced out of jobs, forced to step aside. And uh, women that did retain their jobs in the Depression oftentimes faced a lot of um, social scrutiny because they were seen to be working just to pay for frivolous things. As time progressed, more and more women were continuing to hold jobs and in some cases getting jobs more than men simply because they had to support families. But in the early days here, 1933, if you were female and had a job, it was because you were out trying to support your shopping habit not because you actually needed to work. That was the, the overall uh, mentality by most people in the United States. So in any case, um, the FARA and CWA <coughs> starts out this experimental idea of creating a federal works of art program. And I don't have a slide, unfortunately, for it, but if you go down to, um, I think it's still there last time I checked, the bankruptcy court which you have to go and look for it, but it's downtown. Um, you can see Bell's um, PWAP mural, which is um, simply a mural of every industry in San Diego, from uh, shipbuilding and Navy and aeronautics all the way through to um, farming. So she had done this, this fabulous mural under PWAP. The problem with the Public Works of Art program or project is that Roosevelt was very worried that, as he put it, the American people would look at relief as a narcotic. He did not want them getting hooked on the fact that there would always be a job that you know supported them in some sort of lifestyle, um, and that this job would be, in some cases, uh, people would get paid a very decent wage for doing a job that was, first of all, an unskilled labor position in some cases, and secondly, uh, the prevailing wage system under CWA and the Public Works of Arts Project was actually unsustainable because if you looked at it um, in that era, 1933-34, uh, the cost of actually paying a worker every year at that prevailing wage rate would have been somewhere in the neighborhood of $4,000 a year per person. And so, this is an era when the average family income is about $2,000, maybe $2,500. So you can't continue at that rate, otherwise the, the already big deficit would be even more bloated. 
And so, and I, I'm just so not pleased, but I find it interesting today that we're in this um, stimulus mode at the moment because you can see some of the same ideas being tossed around and some of these big dollar figures that we're kind of gasping at. For people in the 1930s, this was just, you know, oh my goodness, that's too much money. So Roosevelt was very, very alarmed at the fact that um, he, he didn't want people to come to rely on this, this relief as a permanent uh, back-to-work lifestyle. So, and the other problem with both the, the CWA and the Public Works of Art project is that they, um, and they will run into this again with the, the emerging WPA, um, they, these agencies were going to have to work in cooperation with the state governments. So the federal government would put in so many mil billions of dollars and divide that up into 16 regions usually and give that out then um, per state based on population. Um, what Roosevelt um, uh, wanted to make sure didn't happen was that um, you, you didn't see states that were, were less populated getting a huge amount of money um, and states that were very populated not getting enough. Um, but because of population and uh, just the amount of artists and living in such areas, places like Los Angeles, uh, even San Francisco more than Los Angeles, but Los Angeles and New York um, statistically got more money than San Diego did. So on the surface, it looks like all of these programs are going to put lots of people back to work. And the reality is actually quite different um, because they do eventually run out of funds. So he was on the right track, but the PWAP needed to be massive, and it just was not enough money to keep it sustained. So eventually, in 1935, uh, the WPA will be created, and the WPA is, um, stands for Works Progress Administration. It's later on changed to the Works Projects Administration. Um, but the, the WPA had, again, set out with a plan to hire um, laborers to do construction projects um, as a way of stimulating the economy. Um, but also part of that because it largely due to the influence of Harry Hopkins, who had worked for the FARA and the PWAP. Uh, Harry Hopkins, who had come up with Roosevelt through uh, the New York State system, um, was also close friends with Eleanor Roosevelt. And the two of them concocted that they were just going to corner FDR and force him to do some sort of massive relief effort for the arts. And so Eleanor here, I think, deserves a lot of credit for really taking his arm and twisting it and saying, you will do this. Uh, one thing, though, that's uh, good to point out, the, the federal, um, the WPA uh, arts programs all fall under uh, a, an agency that worked in conjunction and was part of the WPA. But if you look at it, if you're going out to do research, it would be called the FAP, which stands for the Federal Art Program. And within the FAP, it was divided into four sections. So there was an actual arts program, and then there was a, uh, a theater program, a writer's program, uh, and a historical records um, program. So these divisions were also going to set out and do, um, first and foremost, they were supposed to document what Roosevelt called the American scene which is sort of like linear expressionism that can mean anything you almost want it to mean. But um, the idea that Roosevelt came up with here in conjunction with Eleanor and Harry Hopkins was that uh, Americans actually had culture, uh, regardless of what Europeans said about them. There was a lot of high art being produced in the United States, and nobody was paying any attention to it. So what he wanted to do was have artists go out and paint all the good things they could find about America, and especially in a regional area in different regions. And so this project was great in a number of ways because first and foremost, it will give artists um, a job with a decent amount of money. The pay was not as high as the, the PWAP, um, but what did occur under um, the WPA was they uh, had a, a, they kind of got rid of, the, the prevailing wage to an extent was kept in place in some localities, not everywhere. 
Um, and that was something that had to be negotiated with states. And you see that more in New York and places that are sort of, um, as detractors would call, hotbeds of radicalism, uh, places where unions would have been strong. Um, and so the, uh, the prevailing wage um, idea is, is going to be eventually substituted for what they call a security wage. And so the security wage was that you had to pay everybody on WPA um, a security wage of between, um, usually it was, for, for most artists, it was usually between 55 and $96 a month. So as you can see, that's not going to be as high as the, the PWA amount of $4,000 a year per person. But um, $55 to $96 a month was pretty, pretty reasonable. The problem with WPA, though, and this is if, if President Obama or Congress decides to do it again, this is one thing they need to fix right off the bat. But uh, the problem with WPA was that you could only be uh, a worker on a relief project for 18 months. After that, you had to, even if there was no other work, you had to leave the relief roles, leave WPA, and reapply all over again uh, to be back on the roles at a later date. So you could, 18 months, then you had to be off. It was usually like three or four months you had to be off, and then you had to reapply again. So there always had to be a break. You couldn't continuously work uh, for WPA consistently for four years. Um, another thing that was a problem, of course, is that only one person per household could have a WPA job. So, in a way, in a strange way, Belle is actually lucky here because she's a single woman. So, therefore, she's the head of her own household. She had artist friends that were also quite good that could not get WPA jobs because they were either married to guys that were doing construction jobs or some sort of um, professional labor jobs under WPA. Um, or worse yet, they were married to an artist and that artist was given, because he was male, he was kind of chosen as head of household and therefore more deserving of um, the art commission versus the female. So that, that in itself was also a problem for women. So they faced lots of obstacles during the depression. So this, what I've got up on the board here, this is not the best slide, I do apologize for it. There's a bit of a glare on it. Uh, this is part of um, Belle Verichato's mural that she does um, starting in, it was completed from 1934 to 35. Um, and the, the group that she did this under um, is probably at that time would have fit the category of the Federal Art Project. Um, one of the most infuriating things I have found in researching all of this is the fact that nobody seems to know what project she was working on at what time. So in some articles, this would be a PWAP project, a Public Works of Art project. Others say it's a WPA federal art project. Uh, still others will list it as something entirely different. Um, it has actually been uh, incorrectly labeled as a treasury relief art project that we'll get to in just a second. But it's just kind of frustrating when you're going through records and studying to try and pinpoint um, who exactly is her immediate boss, what agency is she working for, and worse yet, how much was she getting paid? Um, because the WPA is notorious for keeping very good records of a lot of things. Um, unfortunately, most of it was destroyed as soon as the project was over, uh, including works of art. So it would be great if this stuff actually, you know, and it would have been probably very tedious, but even on a local level, if they could have said, here's 10 artists that were working in 1935, and this is how much they earned. We don't actually have those figures, so that's kind of troubling as you're studying this stuff more in depth. But anyway, this, this is part of a mural. If you want to go and see this, first of all, you're not allowed in. I should just point that out because I've tried. Um, it's in the Balboa Park Club in Balboa Park. But if you are nosy like I am, you can go up to the door and try and take a picture of it. Um, but the, um, you have to talk to uh, the people within the historical society to go and see it. One of the reasons that they've started closing it off in the Balboa Park Club is that um, like a lot of art that's left out for public, um, the public to view, it, it eventually has had some destruction taking place. And so 
Um, they want to make very certain that this one is preserved and kept intact. So therefore, you can go through the window and not do anything else at the moment. Um, anyway, Barachato, this is one of her better pieces. She herself was not happy with this mural. Uh, she thought that this was not representative of her best work. But she did actually um, have some national acclaim and Eleanor Roosevelt, when she came to the exposition in Balboa Park, cornered her and talked about it and said, I really like this, and wrote great things about it back in Washington. So she did actually get the recognition from the First Lady and other art critics at the time. Anyway, this is called The Progress of Man. And what she was trying to do in this mural is show all the different developments um, that uh, human beings have, um, how we've developed or evolved since the beginning all the way to, through to their modern era, which would have been 1935. So um, as you can see, you've got lots of different people working there, scientists and astronomers. Uh, even in the, in the back in the corner in that section, you've got um, a, a friar or a monk probably copying uh, manuscripts. So she was very good at using uh, historical figures and uh, really documenting what she felt was the progress of man at this point in time. So I just want to move on to the next slide and show you. Again, not the greatest. Um, this is uh, Egyptian, the Egyptian part of it. Um, legal system is another thing that she included. This is my favorite part of the, the whole girl because I think this is very indicative of WPA art. Um, the idea of showing uh, a bit of industrial, uh, heavy industry along with the, the ship in the background and um, planes flying overhead and also the fact that uh, human beings have developed music and all of these other cultural aspects of life as well. Uh, here's the, this is what you can see through the door. Not much. <laughs> but a lot of people that have studied WPA art um, especially uh, in, in certain parts of the country, New York is a good example, New York and Chicago, um, detractors are always quick to point out that um, oftentimes this art is just really much a propaganda piece or sort of glorifying the United States and FDR and FDR's New Deal policies because a lot of time is spent on um, murals such as this to depict um, guys with strong arms, you know, building skyscrapers. Um, and it's all very, um, very much a, an homage to Roosevelt and his New Deal. But it also, if you just stand back and take a look at it for, for what it is in 1933, 34, 35, I think you get a, a deeper appreciation. But Barrett Chano here, um, also one of the, the uh, points that people like to I like to ask her about later on was how influenced she was by Mexican muralists. And you can definitely see um, aspects of uh, Rivera and uh, a little bit of this piece, and I'll show you some others as we go on here. But um, she really did not like it when people compared her to Diego Rivera. Um, I, and for some people, they, <laughs> when you read articles, people will always say, well, for obvious reasons. And, Sometimes the reasons are obvious. I'm not really sure, but she claims to have known Diego Rivera. I know she met Diego Rivera in San Francisco. How well she knew him is a whole other story, I and mean, I really don't buy the fact that they were actually friends or anything, and I've never actually heard that from any of the archivists that actually knew her in uh, the later part of her life. But I do find it fascinating that she um, was just incensed any time somebody mentioned his name that she just was it just braided on her nerves. She did not want to be compared with him. I think part of that too is also that uh, a, a lot, there are female muralists out there uh, working in the WPA, but oftentimes um, women that are muralists tended to pick uh, topics that were more geared towards family or children playing in parks and things that weren't really daring or industrial or seemed to be part of the male realm. And I think part of her um, uh, dislike of being compared to Rivera is that it was like, well, you're just a female Diego Rivera. And she wanted to be a female muralist in her own right, not a female copy of Diego Rivera. So I think that there's a little bit of animosity there. 
If I could track down actual evidence that she knew him, it would be fabulous, but so far I haven't been able to do that. Anyway, another project that Verichano worked on, in addition to um, the Federal Art Project, um, from which that Progress of Man slide was done, um, she also worked for the Treasury Relief Art Project, and this one is also called the TRAP, so T-R-A-P. Um, and the Treasury Relief Art Project was definitely more elitist and more desirable to work for. If you were a true artist, you would rather work for TRAP than the Federal Art Project. And Baruchano, um, in her old age, in, in interviews, when people would ask her about it, often discussed um, the, the grueling requirements of the competition just to get the job. The idea here when TRAP was founded, because TRAP actually comes uh, a couple of years prior to the formation of the Federal Art Project. So it starts around 1933, whereas the FAP, Federal Art Project, is going to be developed on a larger scale starting about 1935 and continuing. So TRAP ends up, it's very small in its initial inception, and then it will just kind of blossom out and become a bigger deal as time goes on. But the idea behind the trap was that uh, the, the Treasury Department felt, along with Roosevelt, that if they could um, work uh, and inspire artists the same way that Mexico was inspiring their artists, they could not only employ people, um, but as uh, Diego Rivera aptly put it, they would be painting great works of art at plumber's wages. So what they needed here, this is a pretty good idea for the government. What TRAP does is it allows people to decorate government buildings. So they would send out, allocate money for um, expenses to build different government buildings around the country. And then usually about 1% of the money that was allocated for each of these buildings was set aside for pure decoration of the building. So around town, this one is Baruchano's um, mural up at the La Jolla Post Office. And this is a sketch. I don't really have a good slide of her completed project. But you can go and visit it if you want. Um, there, around town, you have um, countless examples of this. Um, the best known artist besides her for uh, working in WPA and competition projects probably was Donald Ford, um, the sculptor. And so Baron Shana, when she gets involved with um, the Treasury Relief Art Project, it's called the Section um, because it was that was just a nickname for it. But you had to first and foremost be um, uh, nominated by someone locally that thought you were a good artist. So her nomination process has to go through uh, the Fine Arts Gallery here in San Diego, which is actually our Museum of Art in Balboa Park. So the director of the Fine Arts Gallery was a man by the name of Reginald Poland. Excuse me. And so Poland um, actually um, will nominate Bell for this, and he writes a glowing letter of recommendation, and then Treasury Department officials get in touch with her, and she has to send in sketches, and those sketches need to be approved. And this whole system, though, under Treasury, it, it is very... Um, specific and in many ways they are looking to get only the best artists in the country to work on it. Because this is a competition, they can pick and choose who they decide gets the commission. Under WPA and the Federal Art Project, if you can pick up a brush, you could be classified as an artist. And there are some really bad artists that got that title under WPA, or is part of the WPA. And people like Bell, Bell was, did not agree. In fact, oftentimes when people labeled her as a modern artist, even later on, she kind of got upset because they would lump her in with the Jackson Pollocks or uh, other artists in the, in the 50s and 60s. And she would say to herself, that's not me. She was, had the, very much a sense of, she had gone to school, she'd been trained in the classics, she had developed a style, but she was more uh, qualified than some of these other federal art project people. So under Treasury, she ends up sending these, these drawings back and forth numerous times. The biggest obstacle she faced with this mural was the fact that I had to go over the postmaster's door. So a problem right there because 
murals, as most of us would agree, um, are best viewed when they're all in one piece and not really broken up. And so she got this odd, you know, this assignment to, tr to do a mural over the door. And um, she sent it back numerous times because the um, Treasury Department did not like, the jury of the Treasury Department, excuse me, did not like the way the um, roads and hills were moving in the back. Um, they felt that it was a little, you know, too disjointed, and so she has to work on it a few times. And so they would say, I mean, you can really start to see the bureaucracy when you start reading the correspondence, because she'll get a, a letter, that, and the question will be, you know, uh, where does the road go? Where is that house? What's that house there for? And she'll write back like two days later. And then a week after that is another letter. We still don't know where the road goes. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it must have just been like, and you know, she would write back, it goes over the hill. You know, I mean, it was just frustrating. And so, although they have regional directors, the problem was that if you were a qualified artist the way Bell was, you were allowed to work on this completely by yourself. You had submitted a sketch. Once your sketch was um, approved, you had free reign to do the mural. Um, so it's not like she could just go down to Balboa Park and knock on the door of some sort of director and say, can you come and look at this? I'm you know, not really sure how I should do the road or where this tree should go. Um, so all of the communication has to go back to Washington, D.C. All of the money has to come from Washington, D.C. So you get all of these state um, officials that are trying to get projects going, frustrated that Washington is holding things up. You get artists that are frustrated because they're being asked in their mind really stupid questions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not once, it's like a week's worth of stupid questions. And so it, there's a real disconnect between the actual um, running of the program and the putting people to work and watching the product kind of emerge from it. And so she ends up, her, her locus re, local regional director is in Los Angeles. So anytime she has a conflict, she has to have him come down by train to help her out. Anytime she needs supplies, she has to send letters or telegrams up to Los Angeles and say to the guy, I need $50 to buy you know, supplies, otherwise I can't pay. So it's all very bureaucratic, and that was sort of the problem with Treasury. So the Federal Art Project tried to get rid of that, but they weren't terribly successful in erasing the bureaucracy. So anyway, she ends up producing this, this mural for um, La Jolla, and um, post office murals in general are just very interesting to look at. There's been a lot of um, work done on that. And part of the problem, too, that Treasury had was that they were supposed to paint the American scene. Um, but as Belle put it, she, she was not trying to be flippant, but in one of her letters she basically states that La Jolla has no culture or history. <laughs> so it was kind of like, what do you want me to do? Uh, you know, so the best thing she could come up with was something scenic, a landscape. Um, I also find it interesting that in this mural and the earlier one I showed you, she kind of plays it safe. Um, as far as painting goes. And this is because, again, there was this tradition with the Mexican muralists to do these really um, out there revolutionary paintings and really promote the whole idea of revolution and change in government. Um, if you wanted to keep your job within the Treasury Department, you had to do what they call paint section. And that meant even though you had free reign to choose your topic and execute it within certain parameters, if she would have been fired for sure had she gone up and painted it you know, ahead of Lennon or something in the middle of all the trees. Um, so she plays it very safe. And so I find that just fascinating too when it comes to looking at these artists. So what could they have done if they truly had free reign to paint whatever they wanted? So this is one of her last murals. This one is done as part of the WPA project. Um, this was for uh, an auditorium at the La Jolla High School. Um, I really like this one as well. It's very good. Again, she's playing it safe, though. She's just um, painting the seven um, arts as she saw them. Um, and on the right there, you can see Donald Ford is depicted. Um, and he's sculpting his um, one of his, his uh, 
uh, sculptures. I think that one actually, I forget the name of it. It's not the Aztec. That's the one that's downtown in front of um, uh, the Fed, it's not the federal building, but right by the harbor. Yeah, administration. yeah administration building. Exactly. So she was really good at putting, um, she put Ford in there. He, she was uh, a pretty good friend of his, so she was able to sketch him. Um, a few other relatives were used as bottles. Uh, <coughs> And this one, when she was painting it, they actually, the kids that were, went to school there, would practice their um, school orchestra under it while that she was painting. So she said she got a lot of inspiration just by watching their expressions on what she was up to and, and how she was executing things. Uh, this one eventually is destroyed in the 70s. It's not a true fresco, but it was painted onto the wall. And a lot of these WPA um, murals, um, hers and others around the country, um, eventually, especially out here in the West Coast, um, the, a lot of it has to do with the, the fact that buildings were not structurally sound. And so after a while, it was a choice between we have to retrofit the building, but in order to do that, we need to tear this down. So um, artwork starts to be lost. Last but not least, I just wanted to show you, this is another um, sketch for a mural she did. Uh, for Roosevelt High School, and this was one where she was asked to paint um, the four cornerstones of democracy. That was her assignment. And she said to herself, wow, that is really boring. And she felt that it had already been done to death. And so um, she went to uh, the WPA, Federal Art Project people, and said, can I paint something historical? So they said, yeah, go right ahead. So she went back and studied a lot of California history. So this is um, Building Pottery Dam is the name of it. And so what she's doing here, of course, is showing local indigenous people, Native Americans, building the dam. And again, the sketches were drawn, and she had to go back and forth and back and forth for approval. And one of the requirements was that she had to put pants on the Indians. Um, and she ends up, the final product actually does have white pants. And she wrote back, this is not historically accurate, Native Americans didn't wear pants, you know, um, pointed all of this out, but apparently they were so worried that people would find it indecent that she had to make it um, more uh, Anglo-American rather than Native American. So it's just, I find that funny. But anyway, <laughs> that one's called Billings Pottery Dam. Her last assignment was working for the San Diego City Schools Curriculum Project. And this is an offshoot of a WPA funded project. Um, and part of the thing with the curriculum project was that they hired writers um, as well as artists to produce school books. And this is actually a great idea. This is something that could be replicated and save our local economies lots of money, I think. But um, she ended up producing uh, a, a lot of illustrations for these school textbooks and painting things like um, different animals. And this is actually a pen and ink etching that she did for it. Um, animals, local uh, uh, foliage, wildlife, all the rest. And so kids, because they didn't have the money or the resources to take kids on field trips, they could sort of bring all of that into the classroom. Um, the kids that would never go to Europe could see costumes and things of what people might have worn in the Renaissance and stuff of that nature. So the curriculum project was a huge success. And actually, out of all of, all of the jobs she had, this was her longest, um, her, the, the place where she worked the longest. She was, again, because it was WPA funded, they had to abide by that 18-month rule. But she was hired, then fired, then hired, then fired um, consistently on this one. Um, as great as I think this, this uh, drill baboon, as she calls it, is, I don't think it's an example of her finest work. And what I think is just kind of unfortunate is that so many artists, simply due to lack of proper funding and the way the whole, all of these relief projects were set up, they, they just never actually got the chance to accomplish anything truly great. There's only like a small handful that we can pick out and say, wow, that person really amounted to something after WPA. Um, the statistics in New York, which was the, the center of art at this point in time, uh, state that after World War II, um, about 68 to 70% of artists tied back into WPA projects and went to work as art teachers, or, and then the other small 
um, uh, probably another 25% abandon art entirely, and then only a small fraction continue to produce and sell art as true artists after this was all over. So, anyway, so thank you for your time, and I'll let Nina <laughs> ask questions. So, hopefully, this stimulated your interest, and now you go out to all of these places and look for WPA art everywhere. Yeah, I've seen her uh, painting in the post office, but yeah. it's on a wall. There's no door there anymore, and I think they were, uh, last time I was there and paid attention to it, they were doing something to try to, to preserve it in a certain way. But yeah. Did she actually go to that building and paint it right there in situ? No, apparently what she did with the La Jolla mural was that she painted it on canvas and then had it placed after okay. the fact. So so it's canvas there now? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it's not a true mural. The couple of examples of true murals that she did, true frescoes, are gone. So it's probably a good right. thing to do it that way in the long run. Yeah, I, I would think so. I mean, I think if you're going to be a muralist, at least it's portable, <laughs> after, you know, should you need to move it. And the Balboa Park one, did she paint that where it is today? That one is actually, um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think if the Balboa Park one is on campus or not. I don't believe that one, I do, no, the Balboa Park one is canvas as far as I know. Um, but she are there on the wall. Yeah, there. Exactly. Did she have helpers or did she do the whole thing? She did mm -hmm. most of it herself. She didn't like to work with anyone. Um, and a lot of that, I think, she, she claims, and th th that's the other thing, it's hard to really um, ascertain what her relationship was. But she claims the only person she could ever paint with was Angarola. Mm -hmm. And after that, there was no one else that she couldn't stand for anybody to be in her way. Bits of it. Um, and she would have been classified as a, uh, a master artist, and so she wouldn't have needed to have people unless she wanted them. Um, but Rivera had lots of yeah, people doing his stuff. Apparently, yeah. And I think I think in Rivera's case, um, he he was catapulted to such great fame that he had so many commissions he had to have it done rather quickly. And so I think the only way for him to do that was to hire a lot of people. I didn't mention that in my talk, but she does work with another artist that's not very well known, but his name's Todra Skeller in Chicago. And when she was there in the late 20s, Todra Skeller actually had become pretty famous in uh, Chicago and other East Coast cities. And he was asked to illustrate a book on Jewish um, post-biblical stories was what it was called. And, um, and so anyway, she ended up actually doing all of the illustrations for Geller because he basically said, I don't have time to do this. I need the money. Is there any way you draw this stuff? And she ends up, if you look at it very carefully, um, because she was still Goldschlager at that point, you can't tell the difference between a T and a J, or sorry, a T and a B. Um, when she's uh, citing her name. So we think she did it intentionally because that was her way of saying, I did it, but he's getting credit for it. So <laughs> later on, he did actually acknowledge that she, he didn't really do any of the work for that book. But, but it just goes to show you, when you do become famous, you get so much work you can't keep up. So you have to hire it out. <laughs> any other questions? No. I have one comment I'd like to make mm -hmm. that, um, and you mentioned, uh, which I think is really interesting, the stimulus package today, and uh, a lot of the complaints that you were hearing, uh, people opposed to it going through, was, well, they're giving, they're giving money to the National Endowment yeah. for the Arts, and, and 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 Congressperson after Congressperson on the Republican side was standing up just 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 incensed mm -hmm. that any money would be given to artists as yeah. if that was somehow going to stimulate the economy or that was anything worth paying for. And yeah. uh, I, I just wonder if you have anything to say about the contrast of the attitude of the, you know, the political attitude towards art then and art today. Mm -hmm. I think it was the same. Uh, very much the same because a lot of the, even for the larger WPA construction <coughs> projects, a lot of them are called boondoggles simply because people are like, you know, you can take dirt from one place and move it over here and we're going to pay you 
you know, two dollars a day or whatever it was. Um, and a lot there seemed to be a lot of waste. Was she painting other things during this time as well, besides the art that she had to do for a certain style to get these contracts? She does a little bit of it, but not much, which leads me to believe that she, when she was working, she was working a lot and putting in very long hours. The other weird thing, too, about um, a lot of these government relief projects for the arts is that they only allowed them to work um, a maximum of eight hours a day, 40, day, 40 hour, hours a week. So that was the maximum, which sounds great to us, but if you're an artist and you're really into your topic, you might want to stay up like three days in a row and just go at it and finish your project. Um, so she was, I think a lot of it took a lot longer and there was more time involved simply because she was not able to get into um, not able to spend the same amount of time. But I think to answer your question, not really any, um, she just seemed to be trying to keep her herself fed and her family fed more than anything. But she does, she does produce um, a few things on the side, mostly still lives because that's what people buy, I guess. And um, one of the complaints she had, she said in the depression was people would come up to her and say, uh, is it the Fine Arts Gallery, the Art Museum, actually did a good job of promoting artists in the Spanish village. They had studios and people would go and shop. And then um, they also had art marts where they would just set up in the middle of the park and it would be like, we still have this on Saturdays every once in a while around here, but people would go and buy it. She said constantly she would hear, if I didn't have to buy groceries, I'd buy your painting. And, you know, and I was thinking because as I was writing over the summer doing some of the work on this um, dissertation. I was at my local public library, which is really nice, and one of the things that they do in there is kind of like this room, they exhibit works of art by students and other local people. And there were three there that I just loved, and they were only like $250, and I was thinking in the back of my head, if I didn't have to buy groceries, <laughs> I'd buy that painting, because I could see down the road that person's gonna be somebody, I'm sure, and you're gonna just kick yourself. You're like, God, I wish I would just spent the $250 when I didn't have it. But, but getting back to your question, I think there's the same attitude that art is. It seems to be worse now because yeah. they don't even, at least there was an, an attitude towards we should do this as, now it's just looked at as, yeah. Oh, Art is a joke. I mean, we don't need to teach it in school, and yeah. and it's it's a it's a freeloading activity. It's not anything worthwhile. I mean, it seems yeah. to be the attitude. I think maybe if um, if Mr. Obama does this again, um, maybe he can redirect the wording or the language a bit because there are a lot of graphic artists and web designers and people that are now out of work that could use money to do that type of job, and you know, he can make. Poster. I mean, some of the weirdest art, a lot of the art that was produced in this period was in printmaking and posters. Things like, you know, I register for social security. I mean, they're just like <laughs> advertisements and stuff that we don't consider high art, but that was somebody's paycheck and they got to practice their trade and it was a good thing. So. And those pieces were very much in that style. Yeah. The, the men with the big arms. Exactly. It was really typical in that time. Yeah. That, so you could bring that back. When she had done the um, the pictures of her grandmother and of her sister, mm -hmm. were they kind of looked like a reflection of one another in a sense where they were both kind of disinterested. Did she yeah. do those in the same basic time frame, or was she? What did she have in mind? I think it, it definitely was done in the same year. I'm not exactly sure if it was the same month or exact time frame, but yeah, she definitely. I mean, she's. <laughs> fighting against the brick wall, I think, of trying to get people to And it looked pose. like when the sister was done, it looked like they were kind of in a mirror, like this is how you're going to be yeah. in childhood, and then this is the same person as a Can I adult. add to that? Mm -hmm. I, I knew her. She was uh, oh, did you? my art teacher. I'm going to talk to you. And, um, <laughs> and she, when I saw that picture of her grandmother, that's exactly how she looked. Yeah. And she, she looked all exactly like that. And she... You know, she was a very nice person, but she was pretty solid. And that 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 was exactly how she looked. And she also looked like her sister. And it was, that was amazing from a from a um, you know technical standpoint. It yeah. was 
like she was taking a photograph. So, it, I mean, that really captures personality, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Yeah. So that was very interesting. So you must have been a student at Francis Parker. I was, yeah. as were both of my parents. Oh, that's so good. So. Uh, Neat. Yeah. Well, I have to talk after. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. Susan, I'm sorry. Yeah, real quickly, how, did her parents pay for her to go to art school in Minneapolis? How I, did she get to art school, and how? I. That's not really clear. I think despite because I do know when she went to. In, in Minneapolis, but definitely by the time she went to Chicago, she applied for several scholarships. So she might have had a little bit of aid somewhere along the way. Um, it's hard to tell with her family. I think if anybody had money, it might have been her grandmother. So, but the, the neat thing I think about it though is that her she comes from this family of apparently lousy male members of the family, but the female figures are very strong and very much independent and wanting to promote education and have to, wanting her to have a profession and the, the idea of, you know, you don't have to get married. That in the 1920s is a pretty new thing um, because they're still, they're still fighting, I think, even though you have flappers and all of that going on, I think the parents' mentality is still one of very much a traditional family where once you hit 20, you get married, and then you start having kids. And, and she never got married after her disappointment. No, no. And I, I don't really, I'm, I, that's why I want to talk to you. <laughs> I really don't know how um, how devastated she was by that. And I really wish she hadn't burned all of her correspondence. But, you know, truthfully, I would do the same thing. Um, because I, I mean, that's a very old European custom. but. Um, it's sort of like that's your that's the last little bit of privacy you have. So I can see why if you already are making um, it, it was mostly her her good friend Emily Wallace at the end of her life, um, end of Belle's life because she ends up getting uh, dementia and has Alzheimer's. And so um, at the end of her life, she was trying very hard to make sure that all of this great stuff got put somewhere and taken care of. So she made a lot of. Um, a lot of attempts to make sure that everything was taken. So I think the historical society has all of the information that's left to us about her. Now, whether or not Italy selectively got rid of things, you know, we'll never know. But, um, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, so I would like to, I would love to know um, what, if it really was his death or maybe she just was simply a person that never wanted to be married. Um, in some art historian circles, there are there's whispers that she probably, she might have been gay. I, I don't know. And since she's well, dead, I she know her. a strong woman, what else? Would yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> That's the, and again, yeah, I mean, there's, it seems so funny because I was, I had this discussion with my professor up at Claremont and I was telling my colleagues at the other college this, I mean, I was telling them months ago that if she was a communist lesbian artist, this would be in the bag. I would be already done. Um, you know, be, because it's just so frustrating, this idea that it, she could have been a normal person that just happened to be against marriage or never found the right person and just was doing her own thing. You know, that's, again, like, doesn't quite fit. There must be something wrong with her. So. I may have missed this, but when did she die? 1988. Ooh, really? Yeah. 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 So she had a, and um, she was in her 80s, I believe, when she died. So she had a long life. She ended up being, I think, uh, more of a mentor. She ended up working at Frances Parker right after, um, at, in the post-war year, she was started at Parker, and she worked there all through the 60s. And all of a sudden, the room that her teachers know that by the time you're grading and everything, you don't really have much extra free time on your hands. So I think that slowed her down a bit. Um, I think also um, she didn't fit the modern art of uh, Willem de Kern and Koenig or Jackson Pollock, and she didn't want to just sell out and be like that. So she was continuing to produce art that she liked and selling it in galleries, but it wasn't uh, always widely recognized. Or um, you know, she did win prizes in certain competitions, but not as much as she did when she was younger. Great. Uh, actually, I have a question. Sure. I, I don't know if, if 
if you can answer it, but it intrigued me that you said uh, that she has gray in her paintings. Uh, some artists actually, within their palette, they mix every color that they right. used with gray. Really? Do you know if she actually did that? I don't, I don't. Okay. See now, this is what my professor wants me to investigate because in art historic, historical <coughs> circles, they often say that if you're using gray, especially in this era, it's uh, indicative of communist tendencies. <laughs> so, <laughs> based on that one thing, maybe, I don't think I can get a whole chapter out of it. I truly don't think she was communist. I, I really don't think so. I think she was just, again, probably happy to have a job, playing it safe, not painting anything controversial, but doing really good work. Um, <laughs> But her paintings were mostly that she used the umber and, you know, yeah. what, that first painting that you showed, that the color, that building, that new building, that was dominant in all of her stuff. Yeah. You saw, and I saw her palettes laying around. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. And they were all the, the earth tones and then just a, a little yeah. bit. And Everett Jackson's description yeah. was spot on. I wasn't able to show that, but in the um, at the historical society, they do have a painting of her with the ghost, apparently her muse of anger bullet up in the clouds, and that one is all gray. Um, I have the book with me; I can show you. But um, uh, it's you know, it, she does seem to kind of use some more muted colors, but that's probably just preference. I don't read much into it. <laughs> Maybe I should, I don't know. <laughs> apparently she, and I don't know if you could attest to this as well, um, apparently when she was painting at, in her house or her studio, she used to have a big sign up that would say, go away, <laughs> leave me alone. Yeah. And, and so I, I, I get the impression just from reading all of her stuff that she was pretty fiery. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> she could change her mood fairly yeah. quickly. But she had a whistle. She'd wear a whistle around <laughs> her neck. And it, the noise level got too high in the classroom, she'd blow that whistle. And I didn't want that whistle to be blown. Because you'd be standing right next to her and she'd blow the whistle. And, oh. <laughs> she scared me to death. <laughs> well, I told, the, I, you probably saw the thing at the Historical Society. Mm -hmm. And um, as one of her students, I, the, Frances Parker was involved with it. And yeah. I told the story on the video about when my first day in her class, we marched in there, and I was a real little kid. I was probably in second grade or something like that. And she took role, and I had never experienced that before. And so she got to my name and stopped and said, it's your father, Philip Gildred. And I thought that I was in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't want you to blow that whistle. <laughs> and then she said, well, your your father was one of my students, and I, all I could think of is, well, you must be the oldest person in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have no idea how old she was at the time, but you know, 150. I don't know. <laughs> she seems like she was really a character. That's she was I, a character. I'm, I'm glad I got to been able to look at all of her stuff and research it. Because every time I mention who I'm working on, nobody knows. No. And the, San Diego. the La Jolla High mural, don't you think that that's her in the corner? The I am. Yeah. I think so. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know for sure, no, but it I, looks I like think, it to me. Yeah, I, I'm pretty certain it is. Yeah. Um, that one was funny, too, because she actually wore pants when she was painting. Yet another reason why she's gay. <laughs> she wore pants and overalls rather than... <laughs> Skirts. And the, actually, the story behind that is that um, that she uh, actually went up to do it wearing a skirt, and the workmen that were working on something else said, I can't believe she's going to paint the skirt. That's so indecent. So the next day, she came in pants. So it's like, you can't win. <laughs> can't win anyway. But um, thank you for letting me talk. This is well, really thank you so much.